Okay, key teaser. There we go. Right, what have we got here? Let me just move this chair so I can twist it round a bit. Oh. Splendid. Right, there we go. Old lady, hello Jane, how's your Billy? I haven't seen him in a while. Oh, says Jane, he's doing fine. He started going to church. Old lady, oh, that's good. <clears throat> Jane, yes, they meet on Saturdays. They study the first five books of the Bible. He's usually there for about five hours. Oh, says <laughs> the lady with a concerned face. <clears throat> what a thing to have happened. So, <clears throat> I put that up because um, I often, I remember, well, it doesn't happen so much now, but I remember my mum telling me, you can't expect people to be in church for five hours, that's ridiculous. <laughs> She's obviously coming from the angle that, you know, she used to go to Catholic churches. Um, <clears throat> but of course, we're all here today to study the Word and to you know, enjoy all the good stuff of eating and fellowship. So we're all here today. What a thing to have happened. And it is, isn't it? That we would all meet, that we would come round to discuss and see what the Word has to offer, to um, see what the Lord has to teach us. Now, Paul writes to Timothy. Timothy, by the way, was born of a Jewish mother who had become a Christian believer and he had a Greek father. The Apostle Paul met him during his second missionary journey, and he became Paul's companion missionary partner along with Silas. And he writes to him and he says, As for you, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And how from childhood, remember he has a Jewish mother, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, clearly it's a reference to the word, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. So, the words of the sacred writings, the Torah, the Word, are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Yeshua. And it's this very same Torah that is apparently done away with, thanks to Jesus, which is a bit odd for people coming from a Christian perspective to have to deal with. The words of the sacred writings, the Torah, train you to live righteously. They correct and they reprove you when you err, uh, so they keep you online. Paul tells Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. And with regards to events that we find in the sacred writings, the Torah, including events that are covered in today's Parsha, Paul writes to the Corinthians and says this, These things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as, as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it's written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Don't be like these people. <clears throat> and we see that this is written with regards to the golden calf incident from our Parsha. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Paul continues and says, We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. And that is a reference to Israel abode in Shittim and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. They called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself with Baal Peor, and the anger of Jehovah was kindled against Israel. The people were seduced and up um, guilty of idolatry. Now in that incident, who was it that was able to stand and not fall? Moshe addresses the people at Shittim. He says, Your eyes have seen what Yehovah did at Baal Peor, for that Yehovah your God destroyed from among you all the men who followed the Baal of Peor. Just false God. But you who held fast 
to Yehovah your God are all alive today. What is it to hold fast to Yehovah? Deuteronomy 13, 4. You shall walk after Yehovah your God, fear him, keep his commandments, obey his voice, and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. This word here is the same word used um, when Moshe speaks and says, you who have cleaved, held fast, are alive today. So to hold fast to him is to fear him, to cherish his commandments, and to shema his voice. If we go back to 1 Corinthians 10, Paul continues, he said, We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble if some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. And we see this episode uh, with the serpents described in Numbers 21. The people spake against God and against Moshe. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread, the manna. Yehovah, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they, and they bit the people, and much of the people of Israel died. And they sound much like the first generation to me who actually said, there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Dissatisfaction with the, uh, with the manna, the bread from heaven. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, <clears throat> after the Lord um, sends the serpents, we have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moshe prayed for the people. So this is what they've said. Our soul loads this late bread. The first generation and the second generation. Guilty of pretty much saying the same thing. It's an awful complaint <clears throat> that they made against the bread. The divine manna from heaven. The rejecting of it brought immediate judgment from Yehovah. Yeshua, who is the word made flesh, we're told, compared himself to this bread. He said, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. Yeshua also stated, he said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Sadly, there are many who cry out, our soul loathes this light bread. People have no idea that when they turn from Yehovah's word, they are turning from Yeshua, who is the bread of life. And it's often not so much by the words that come out of their mouths that folk declare our soul loads this light bread, but rather by their actions and by the choices that they make. And here we have in the word a warning to not be like these people. The Lord said to Moshe, make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, a standard, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten when he looks upon it shall live. Now, today in repentance, we look to Yeshua. In John 3, 14, we read, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should have eternal life. So in this episode, we have a picture that Yeshua refers to regarding himself. And if we go back to John 6, we see the importance of never taking our eyes off Yeshua. She was said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you've seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And later he says, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Moshe made a serpent of brass, he put it on a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpents of brass, he lived. We can see the picture that this gives us. Again, the Torah pointing us to Yeshua, making us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. See, many people do think we're mad to come and spend five hours and study, particularly the first five books of the Scriptures. They think it's completely balmy. And they don't realize how amazing these five books are. They don't realize that they point um, so powerfully to the Messiah and what he did for us. Now, what became of the bronze serpent? And we get our answer here. He, King Hezekiah, did what was right in the eyes of Yehovah, according to all that David his father had done. He removed the high places, he broke the pillars, and cut down the Asherah, and he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moshe had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Neshistan. So they turned this thing into an idol, something to be worshipped. 
But this king Hezekiah, he trusted in Yehovah, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast, it's this word again, the back to Yehovah. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that Yehovah commanded Moshe. So we see that those who strived uh, survived the incident at Shittim, where many went after Baal Pure and were destroyed, were those that held fast to Yehovah. The king who sought to lead Israel away from idolatry also held fast to Yehovah. To hold fast to Yehovah, according to Deuteronomy 13, 4, is to fear him, to cherish his commandments, and to shema his voice. 2 Timothy 3, 14. As for you, continue what you have learned and firmly believed. Continue on in the word. If we want to remain faithful, then we continue on with the sacred writings so that we can hold fast to Yehovah. And so, we come today and we learn what Yehovah's word has to say to us so that we can continue to hold fast to him. Back to 1 Corinthians 10. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did. We're destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble of some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example. But they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. This is all for subsequent generations to benefit from. Therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Now, James 1, 23 to 25 tells us that the word is like a mirror. It lets us know where we are at. And we read, The one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Um, <clears throat> back to Paul's writing. He says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, the trial, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So no test will be too difficult for you to bear. And the word is a, it comes along and it shines a light on where we are at. Um, and it challenges us, it tests us, um, it corrects us. And we see here, <clears throat> for all those people who might want to make excuses for not holding fast to Yehovah. There is no trial that is going to be too difficult for you. But we also see that every test will reveal where your heart is at, whether you actually are true. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Nothing will come along that you'll be able, unable to resist. If you yield to temptation, it is because that's what you chose. It's just that's what you wanted that was what was most important to you. Go back to verse 12. Therefore, anyone who thinks that he stands, take heed lest he fall. It's systemi in the Greek, yet have in the Hebrew. And we looked at these words in Parsha Beshalak. Moshe said to the people, Fear ye not, stand still, yet have see the salvation of the Lord. The Israelites were pursued by the Egyptians, a very real enemy, just as we have a very real enemy. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We see this word, yetzav, in the Greek, histemi. We see it here. We find the word used in conjunction with wearing the armor of Yehovah. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And the armor is the best, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, shoes, uh, the gospel of peace, shield of faith, Helmet, salvation, sword of the Spirit. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. So fear not, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord. We're pursued by Hasset and the adversary. We have to be mindful of the schemes of the devil. How do we stand? Yet, Sav, we put on the armor of Yehovah, which all speaks of walking in his word. Walk in the truth, which is righteousness. Let our walk be one that declares the good news of Yehovah by demonstrating our faith and our obedience to the one in whom we trust, by being mindful of our deliverance and our wonderful Savior Yeshua, by wielding the, the, the word and with prayer. Also, uh, and so in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, we have this warning. And it says, take heed, look, behold, perceive, regard. 
It's a call to take heed that is very much in line with Yeshua's call for us to watch. I see throughout Scripture there are people who think they're doing really well. <clears throat> the people of Israel, if you actually go through their history, oftentimes when they were behaving at their worst, they actually thought they were doing their best. Through it all, I see a great warning. And through scriptures like these, I see a great warning to take heed. Um, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he came to the disciples, Yeshua, and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation, into trials. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So watch and pray, and the two of them go together. Things to watch for. Watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Watch and beware the false teaching and the hypocrisy of religious leaders. Watch out for these things, says the Lord. Now, <clears throat> it's there, plain, written, the words of Yeshua. And yet most people are not vigilant about these things. And they'll suck up all kinds of nonsense and they will, they will go off track. They'll be led away from the truth of the word and um, they won't be found clinging to Yehovah, which is your defense against idolatry and going after false gods. And indeed, that's what they'll end up doing because they'll create a false god for themselves and they will, um, they will go after it. In Romans 16, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been, t been taught. Avoid them. Very often, things will come up or people will come up and they'll have these grandiose ideas of what things mean in Scripture and stuff, and they're perfectly described by what goes on here. And we're told, watch out for all this. Watch out for these false teachers. Watch out for these people who create obstacles and divisions. Be careful. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. So he's given you a bit of an idea as how you might spot these people. <clears throat> Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Throughout Scripture, I see this. Watch, be careful. Watch, be careful. Oh. So, Anyone who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. Keep an eye on these things. If you do not take heed, there is a danger that you might fall. It's a serious call for vigilance. Proverbs 16, the highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He who watches his way preserves his life. So Paul's message, I think, is look at what happened to those calling themselves Jehovah's people. Look how easily they were led astray. The golden calf, they fashioned a God for themselves and attributed Jehovah's name to it. The serpents that came because they loathed the man of the word. It just wasn't enough. Let's have something else. I think that's how a lot of these um, people who cause divisions get a little root in because people are just dissatisfied with the word. They want more. Teach us something new and something different, something exciting. It's like they want to fix, like somebody who's got a high off a drug and they just they want the high again. It's not actually, from what I can see, the people who were led astray like this, it's... When they heard the word and they heard, oh, the truth and the Torah, oh, they were excited by it. It was a little bit of a rush. And then that wears off. They need something else to give them that rush. So really, when they heard the word and the truth for the first time, it wasn't that they actually fell in love with Yehovah and who he was as described in his word. But rather, they just enjoyed the high and the rush that they came. Shatim being led astray by the desires of the flesh. And sadly... So many people who know the truth are guilty of exactly this thing. They led into fornication and idolatry. And of course, if you're living in a lifestyle that is contrary to the word, then you're going to have to fashion yourself a God who is actually okay with that. And it's not Yehovah. It's a God that you've fashioned and you are guilty of idolatry. So we look at these people, and then we look at ourselves. Later in his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul writes, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand. 
by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word that I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Be watchful, stand firm, later again in his letter, in the faith, act like men, be courageous, be Andrew in the Greek, Hazak in the Hebrew, be strong, and to be Hazak, keep the whole commandment that I command you today, that you might be Hazak. Being strong and courageous is equated with not being deterred from walking in all Yehovah's ways. We have all our different standards, don't we, in the world by which we consider a person to be a strong character. Oh, yes, something else. Um, but scripturally, the strong are those who, despite what comes their way, what temptation, what nonsense, whatever drivel, whatever situations, they stick to walking by the word. The word corrects us, of course, when we go wrong. We are to continue to be mindful to continue on in it. Not to get lackadaisical and like, oh, yeah, okay. Lest we will have believed in vain. We read in Luke, strive to enter through the narrow door. Strive, there's a word. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I think it's interesting that he says, not just when I'm there. I think there's certain people who... They have dodgy things in their lives, and um, they know it's wrong, and um, what tends to happen is they'll pick somebody who they think is righteous, and they'll seek to impress that person in some sort of a way um, to win favor from that person, and in so doing, they get this false impression or this false idea that actually they're not doing too bad. So-and-so quite likes me. He seems to think I'm all right. But it's baloney. You don't obey sometimes. You obey all the time because that's where your heart is at. It's actually about being surrendered to Yehovah, not impressing people or any of that nonsense. We read, put on the armor, walk in accordance with the word, and stand and pray. Yeshua said, watch and pray. We've been told to hold fast to Yehovah, to hold fast to the word. We're called to be vigilant. And it is valuable to take the time to sit and listen to the word of Yehovah for its instruction in righteousness. It is good to concern ourselves with holding fast to it. So ask yourself, what concerns you? Luke 10 as they went on their way, Yeshua entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, why are you anxious? You, rather, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken from her. So don't forget the need to focus on your Messiah. Serving is great. It's brilliant. And obviously the Lord appreciates people who serve. But don't forget the need to focus on your Messiah. Don't get carried away with too many distractions and cares and worries and things like that to forget to focus on the Messiah, to hear his words, to take the time to sit at his feet and learn from him. No matter how well intentioned your activity, don't let the stresses of this world stop you from what is necessary. Sometimes we think we've got it right. Luke 11, as he said these things, he's teaching a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nursed. And, you know, everybody's going to go, Yay! And give a big cheer. And Yeshua says, Yeah, rather, blessed are they that hear, that Shema, the word of God, and keep it. Just keeping it, bang, there's the truth. Earlier in Luke, he sends the 70 out, they come back, and they're all made up. 
He says, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. We need to hear the words of our master. Sometimes with good intentions or whatever it might be, we kind of can lose and miss the point of what really is truly important. We need to remain being able to see things from his perspective. Folk have their own standards by which they judge who and what is blessed. But according to Yeshua, the one coming back, who says, Behold, I come quickly, my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. According to him, it is those who continue on in his word, guarding it and cherishing it, that are truly blessed. The one he says, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now, last week we were given many details about the tabernacle and its furnishings. We went through lots of the stuff uh, that we see in this image. JP um, gave us the details and an overview, how it relates to us and the Messiah and us as a body. Instructions regarding the tabernacle and its construction, its furnishings, its implements, designation of the priesthood, their duties, the garments, instructions for acceptable sacrifices, special meeting times, all the stuff that, you know, with the priest and everything, it all comes to 50 chapters in the Torah, which is huge, isn't it? So far in Exodus 25 to 28, it's given us details about the following furnishings. The ark, table of showbread, the lampstand, the curtains, the clasps and loops covering of the tabernacle, its frame, its bases, the bronze altar, the outer court, and the priest's garments. Exodus 29 dealt mainly with the consecration of the priests. Exodus 31 to 5 described the construction of the altar of incense from acacia wood overlaid with gold. Exodus 36 says, And you shall put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with you. Now there is one piece of furniture yet to be mentioned and it is the bronze laver. This gets mentioned in Exodus 30, 17 to 21. And then the oil and the incense get a mention, which we'll look at. But first is the census tax. The Lord spake to Moshe, saying, When you take the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall I give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord, when you number them, that there be no plague among them, when you number them. So when the children of Israel are to be numbered, they must bring a ransom for their soul. This they shall give everyone that passes along uh, among them that are numbered, half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is 20 gerahs, and half a shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. Everyone that passes among them that are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering unto the Lord. And you shall take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. This is the scripture, uh, is the basis for what became known as the temple tax, paid once a year for the upkeep and maintenance of the temple in Jerusalem. Um, and this was in place during Yeshua's first coming. There's a silver coin that was used. Yeshua in the temple tax. When they come to Capernaum, they received tribute money, came to Peter and said, does not your master pay tribute? And he said, yes. When he was coming to the house, Yeshua prevented him saying, what do you think, Simon, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute of their own uh, children or of strangers? Remember, this is for the upkeep of the temple. Peter said, well, of strangers. And Yeshua said to him, then are the children free, or in another translation, the sons are free. Notwithstanding, he continues, lest we should offend them, Go to the sea, cast a hook, and take up the fish that first comes up. And when you have opened his mouth, you'll find a piece of money that take and give to them for me and you. So that will be our um, tax. The implications of the scripture, Yeshua was declaring himself to be the son of God. The father would also provide the temple tax for Peter as if Peter too were a son. And so, in following Yeshua and his words, Peter was atoned for and his ransom, which this represents, was paid. <clears throat> Thereby Peter was numbered among the people. And um, <clears throat> we'll quickly go through this because a lot of people know this, but in the end times, we do seem to have two groups of Yehovah's people, those who are numbered and those who cannot be numbered. Now, as we've seen, 
to be numbered amongst his people, you need to have this um, atonement paid for, this, um, this money for your, uh, to, for, to have yourself counted as his people. Or to put it another way, in the end times, there are two groups of people who count themselves as the people of um, the God of Scripture. And what we'll actually see is one group will find themselves uh, in the wilderness being nourished, while the other will be chastised in the tribulation. Read, when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman, who I believe is to be Israel, you can make your own mind up, who would give birth to the male child, who I believe to be Yeshua. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she's to be nourished for a time and time and half a time. Of course, everything is cyclical. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle, Exodus 19.4. You yourselves seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Obviously a reference to what we read in uh, Beshelach. Serpent poured water like, like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sleep it, sweep it away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. So here we see that Yehovah sustains and protects those who are in the wilderness. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God, and hold to the testimony of Yeshua, and he stood on the sand of the sea. So those who can be counted, find themselves in the wilderness being nourished, cannot be counted, they will be chastised in the tribulation. So when the children of Israel are to be numbered, they must bring a ransom for their soul, or they suffer plague. But we see that the sons go free. In the Hebrew, the text of Torah does not say when you count the children of Israel. The text of Torah instead talks about when Moshe lifts up the head of the children of Israel. There are two ways to have your head lifted up. <clears throat> Yosef speaks to the cupbearer. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you. Good. Good way to have your head lifted up. To the baker, he says, in three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you. Not good. And hang you on a tree, the birds will eat your flesh. Now we see in scripture those who were numbered. <clears throat> I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000. There we go, 12,000 from each tribe. I looked, behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. It is these who not defile themselves with women, they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. In their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless, not defiled, blameless, spotless. It's the Greek amamos, and it's the equivalent word in the Hebrew is tamim. They are fully Yehovah's. They're virgins, they're spiritually pure. They, fo they follow the Lamb. In other words, they're obedient. Those that can be numbered, the 144,000, Revelation 3. Because you've kept my word about patience and endurance, I will keep you. From the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. So as we see here, the ones who keep his word, protected, nourished, we read in Revelation 12. I am coming soon, hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Interesting. What held the pillars in place in the Mishkan, which is after all just a picture of a heavenly real reality? The answer is the silver sockets made from the silver that was given as a ransom for one's life. Exodus 26. Thou shalt hang up four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold, same as the ark. Their hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver. And then there is these people in Revelation. You say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing you are wretched, pitiful, poor, by an and naked. Those who erroneously think that they're doing well and count themselves as Yehovah's people. And if we go through this, we see there's a great tribulation. The Lord says, repent. Okay, those uh, be zealous and repent. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. And then we see a great multitude that no one could number from every nation. These are the ones coming out the great tribulation those who had been beheaded, those who had had their heads lifted up, but in not a good way, lifted up from them. A great multitude then that could not be numbered. So we have two groups of Yehovah's people in Revelation, those that can be numbered, 
These have their ransom paid. The king provides it for them. They go free as it were. They are therefore counted as his people, and no plague shall befall them. Those that cannot be numbered, these people cannot be counted when the 144,000 are counted, as they have not had their ransom paid for them. These people will suffer as the plagues of the tribulation befall them. Please note, we see that the people that love not their lives unto death shall be atoned for. They shall indeed be finally counted as Yehovah's, because they will have their heads lifted. They shall literally have their heads lifted from them. Remember what Yeshua said, though? He said, the sons go free. So, it would be good to go free and not have to pay the temple head tax, especially not by having your head lifted up by means of having it removed. So, who are the sons who go free? We see in Paul's writings in Romans 9 that it is not the children of the flesh, but the children of the promise who were counted as offspring. He writes, For not all are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. In other words, it has nothing to do with lineage. It has everything to do with your heart. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed, his offspring, as according to the promise. Abraham's seed, his offspring, the children of the promise, these are true Israel. These are Yehovah's servants. You, Israel, are my servant, Yaakov, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. John 1, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed, the stuo, in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Belief, it is this word in the Hebrew, and it's aman, which speaks of being faithful. We see it there. And as we've noted many times, this belief, this faith, and obedience are synonymous. So the obedience and faithful are the children that go free. So many people calling themselves Jehovah's people, but they are not obedient and they are not faithful. And that is why the Lord says that he sends fire of tribulation so that they can be zealous and repent. In love he predestined, predestined us for adoption of sons through Yeshua HaMashiach according to the purpose of his will. So thanks to Yeshua, we can be adopted as his sons, the sons who go free, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So it is through Yeshua that we are adopted as sons, that we are children of the promise. Galatians 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were born under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Incredible. So how do you know if you're a son or a daughter or not? Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. We'll be like him because we will have been conformed to his image. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Every man that has this hope purifies himself. In Ephesians 5, we read, Christ loved the church, gave himself up for it, that he might sanctify it, having cleansed it by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Every man that has this hope purifies himself. How? By washing in the word. So that he can be pure even as he is pure. Whoever commits sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. It's a good one if you're ever in an argument with a Christian who's trying to tell you you're being mental. Just to bring that up and see what they think. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whoever abides in him sins not. Whoever sins has not seen him, neither known him. So this is how we are to recognize who are the sons 
who go free. They're not interested in sinning. They don't transgress the Torah. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. Again, if you want to know who the children are, it's those who practice righteousness. He that commits sin is of the devil. This is so blunt. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, as we said earlier, the word is like a mirror, and it tells us exactly where we're at. It will tell you exactly who you are, whether you are a son of God or a child of the devil. If you continue on in sin, what is it telling you? Whoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whoever does not do righteousness is not of God, neither he that loves not his brother. Righteousness, careful to do all the commandments that he has commanded us. Jehovah's children practice righteousness. Those who do not make a practice of righteousness, instead make a practice of sinning, these are not his children. It's not saying whoever is born of God will never make any mistakes. It means they do not continue on in sin. And if they do sin and they fall, what they do is they repent immediately and walk back to Jehovah because they will be corrected. All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Ezekiel says, I put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Be careful to obey my rules. The obedience of the sons of God. Indeed, Acts 5, we are witness to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So what are those who are not counted among the 144,000? I believe these people count themselves as Jehovah's people, but because they do not have their ransom paid, then they are subject to the plagues, and in this way they are refined. They ultimately pay the price. I believe many of themselves will call themselves Torah keepers, but they are people who continue on in sin. They do not watch. They do not heed. They are not vigilant. What they call themselves is irrelevant if they are stiff-necked rebels who refuse to bow the knee. So you ask yourself, when you look at all this, what about you? Do you believe? Are you obedient? Are you faithful? Will you be counted as one who goes free? Watch ye therefore, said Yeshua, and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So how is Peter's atonement money provided? It came from a fish. What else do we see something coming out of the mouth of a fish? Jonah 2.10, the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out onto the dry land. What wiped me awake of the connection? Matthew 12, he, Yeshua, answered and he said unto them, the scribes and Pharisees, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So here we have a connection between having our ransom paid and Yeshua's death and resurrection. Ransom money comes out of a fish. Yeshua likens his death and resurrection to what happened to Jonas who came out of a fish. Romans 6, 8 says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Obviously, this is speaking to us of dying to self, submitting, being completely humble before Yehovah. Everything points us to Yeshua. The sacred writings, Torah, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. When it came time for the ransom to be paid, we read the following. A becker ahead, that's what you would read, that is a half a shekel by the shekel of the sanctuary, for everyone who was listed in the records from 20 years old and upward for 603,550 uh, men. Exodus 38:26 actually reads, A becker a gulgaleth, that is, and then it goes on. So, a becker a gulgaleth, instead of the word head, the word would have been gulgaleth. It means skull. And we see this word <clears throat> in Matthew 27. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled this man to carry his cross when they came to a place called, we've always known it as Golgotha, but it's 
Golgoleth, which means place of the skull. So <clears throat> what we see is the price that was paid at Golgoleth, or Golgotha as you might want to call it, was the price that was required for your head, your skull, to be counted as one of the children of Israel, the children of the promise. So your Golgoleth, your head, was ransomed at Golgotha. The message is clear. If you want to be counted as one of the sons, one of the sons that go free, who have had their ransom paid, then you have to take up your cross and follow him to the place called Golgotha. That is, to lay down your life that you might live. That's what baptism going under the water represents. It represents dying to self. It represents repentance, turning from your ways to Jehovah's ways. But it does not end there. The purification of the flesh at the priest's ordination involved baptism. It involved full immersion. In Exodus 40, you shall bring Aaron and his sons unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and wash them with water. And it's luo in the Greek, which is wash the whole person. We see it here, <clears throat> to bathe the whole person. As we will see, this word is associated with being cleansed from sin in these two scriptures, which we'll look at in a minute. The bathing is associated with becoming a priest, which, of course, is a calling we all have. We're all told to be a kingdom of priests in Exodus 19. That's what Yeshua said his people would be. Priests not serving in this tabernacle. Priests in the sense that we represent Yehovah. Indeed, 1 Peter 2, 9, we are called to be a royal priesthood. Now, when we're baptized, full immersion, it is an appeal for a clean conscience to uh, be cleansed from dead works, which according to Hebrews 6, 1, is sin. We read in Hebrews 9, if the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works, from sin, to serve the living God? So 1 Peter 3 says, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Yeshua HaMashiach. The purification of the conscience involves repentance. It involves being baptized into Yeshua's death that we might know eternal life through him. And it speaks mostly of this complete surrender of repentance. And it's represented by this full immersion, which we see when we get baptized. As I've mentioned before, it doesn't end there. The purification of the flesh at the police ordina ordination involved baptism, full immersion. And as we shall see, after visiting the bronze altar, before he can minister or approach Jehovah in the holy place, the priest must wash in the laver lest he die. We'll read that in a second. So what's being pictured here, remember, all scripture is given to us for um, instruction in righteousness. What we're seeing is a baptism, this full immersion, this complete surrender, this repentance, followed by an ongoing cleansing in the water, which as we've seen, is the word. We are to purify ourselves. So Yehovah said to Moshe, you shall also make a basin of bronze with its stand of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it, with which Aharon and his son shall wash their hands and their feet. When they go into the tent of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn a food offering to Jehovah, they shall wash with water so that they may not die. They shall wash their hands and their feet so that they may not die, and it shall be a statute um, forever to them, even to him and to his offspring throughout their generations. See in Leviticus 15, Thus you should keep the people of Israel separate from their uncleannesses, lest they die in their uncleannesses by defiling the tabernacle that is in their midst. Just as it is not a good idea to get too close to a live electrical source approaching the physical manifest presence of Yelvah, it's also not a good idea if you are unclean. So these priests were to wash so that they did not enter his presence unclean. In the Hebrew, the word for laver is kuau. I've said that completely correctly there. <laughs> no idea. It is also the word for furnace. Proverbs 17, 3. The refining pot is for silver, 
Um, and the fairness, same word for gold, but Yehovah tests the hearts. So the word carries this connotation of purifying. Bronze laver speaks to us of being washed in the water of the word as it happens. And remember, of course, we are to be found without blemish or spot, washed in the water of the word. Exodus 38 8 tells us this. He made the laver of brass and the foot of it of brass, of the looking glasses, the mirrors of the women assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Which is very fitting, isn't it? It is in the reflections that emanate from this laver that we begin to see ourselves as we really are. The Word lets us know where we're at. James 1, if anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. He looks at himself and he goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perceives, uh, perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So this laver is made out of um, the mirrors of the women. This um, thing that we are to wash in. As we read earlier, the one who continues on in the word is the one who is blessed, Yeshua said. But he said, rather, blessed are you that Shema, the word of God, and Shema. Exactly the same message all the way through scripture. So, Aharon and his sons are washed from head to toe in preparation for their ministry. The laver, however, is for the daily washing of feet and hands only. The difference between a full immersion and a daily washing is pictured in John 13. Yeshua washes the disciples' feet. Now before the feast of Passover, when Yeshua knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now in, uh, Yeshua, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come, uh, come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments, taking a towel, he tied it round his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So we read, Yeshua poured water into a basin. It's given to us very specifically as was the instructions regarding the bronze basin. We read earlier, make a basin of bronze with its stand for washing. You shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar. You shall put water in it. You shall put water in it may seem like an obvious statement, but Scripture does not waste words. There's a connection here between what Yeshua is doing and the instructions for the bronze laver. He said to Simon Peter, he came to Simon Peter rather, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Yeshua answered him, he said, what I do, you know not now, but you shall know hereafter. And he's demonstrating being called to serve, but there's much more going on. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Yeshua answered him, if I wash you not, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Yeshua said to him, he that is washed, and it's this word luo, need not to save to wash his feet, different word, nepto, but is clean every whit, and you are all clean, but not all. So the word we saw before, luo, he that is washed, Okay, Luo, complete person, need not wash except his feet. And it's a different word, nipto, which is to wash, to wash oneself, especially of the hands, of the feet, of the face. So he that is washed need not save what wash his feet. The word for washed used here is pretty unique word. It only occurs five other times throughout the scripture. This word for being completely washed or immersed. We see it in Revelation 1. From Yeshua Hamashiach, who is faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. It's this word. It's one of the scriptures we mentioned earlier, and this is the other. Let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. 2 Peter 2.22, what the proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow that was washed returns to wallow in the mire. Washed in the consecration of the priests, we see it in Exodus 29. <clears throat> this is the thing you shall do to them, to hallow them, to minister to me in the priest's office. 
You shall bring them to the door of the tabernacle and shall wash them with water, luo. As we saw earlier, the consecration is also mentioned later in the book of Exodus in chapter 40. You bring them to the door and you wash them with water. So let us go back to Yeshua's words. He that is washed need not save to wash his feet. So washed, luo, the word is associated with being cleansed from sin. It is associated with being fully immersed and cleansed, ready for priestly robes and ordination, which allows one to begin to serve as a priest in the tabernacle. But in this in mind, we can begin to see the correlation between Yeshua's washing of the feet with the water in the basin and the washing of the priests with the water in the bronze laver as they served in the tabernacle. He said, he? He said he that is washed, luo, which is a full immersion, represented to us by baptism, need not save to wash his feet. This word here, speaking of washing yourself, but you're not all clean. And obviously this is represented by the the bronze lever. And then we read, he knew not, uh, he didn't say that they're all clean, for he knew that one would betray him, therefore he said you are not all clean. Right, the hands are an idiom for what you do. Washing the head is an idiom of having a clean heart because the head and the heart are linked in Hebraic thought. Um, Psalm of David. Who shall ascend the hill of Jehovah and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. So, baptism is all about dying to self-repentance. From this point on, we've been cleansed. Just like the priest in the earthly tabernacle who were fully immersed when ordained, yet yeah, washed daily in the water of the bronze laver, we also need to take care to be continually washed in the water, the word. We've seen the significance of having our head and hands and head washed, so why wash the feet? The feet represent a person's walk. Perhaps it's because of where we walk that we need to be constantly cleansed in the water of his word. We pick up dirt as a result of the places that we've been. And we are bombarded with filth in the world, aren't we? Religion that is pure and undefiled before God is uh, the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, to keep oneself unstained from the word, world, to be clean. So how do we remain clean, unstained? How do we wash in this laver? By immersing ourselves in the water of the word. This laver that's made out of mirrors, the word, which is like a mirror to us, it's the same message throughout Scripture. To wash in the word of God is to apply the word to your life. He made the laver out of looking glasses. The word washes because it reveals as the mirrors were revealers and thus is used in cleansing and beautifying. It's, also, it's at work and as we read in scripture as well. As we read earlier, one of the benefits that arrive from the word of God declared by Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16 is for correction. The word is profitable for correction And indeed, it cleanses by correcting. We read, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. The sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness. But please note what it says. It says, continue. So, For those who've been washed, what will you do? Those who've made this declaration, this um, want to share in Yeshua's death, um, that you might live with him, that he might live through you. What will you do now that you've been washed? Um, We're told that everybody who has this hope of being a child of God purifies themselves. Is that what you will do? Will you continue in what you've believed? Will you continue on in the word? Or will you return like a sow to wallowing in the mire? Go back to all the nonsense. If after they escape the defilement of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Yeshua and Mashiach, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. 
which is obviously a challenge to once saved, always saved thinking. What the truth proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow that was washed, that was fully immersed, that was cleansed, returns to wallow in the mire. Um, and for everybody who watches, I want you to ask yourself, have you returned to wallowing in the mire? Have you gone back to stuff that will defile you? Will you work through this, walk through this world rather picking up all the muck and refuse to wash your feet? Or will you wash in the water of the word? To be washed by the water of the word is to walk according to the word. And so, <clears throat> old lady. Hello, Jane. How's your Billy? I haven't seen him in a while. Oh, he's gone back to his old ways. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, he, he thinks to justify the, the sin in his life and, he, and he's letting himself be defiled by the garbage of the world. Oh, lady, oh, concerned face. What a thing to have happened. Crazy. And yet, there are so many people who do, just like Billy in our little analogy. Take the time when you hear the word today to let it be a mirror to you, to let you know where you're at. Don't continue on thinking that everything is fine trying somehow to convince yourself that sin in your life is okay um, and calling yourself one of his people and trying to, I don't know, impress in some way to try and deflect attention from where you're at. Just let the mirror of the word tell you exactly where you're at and let it correct you so that you might be cleansed. And we are for key teaser part two. Next, we have instructions concerning the anointing oil and the incense to be burned every morning and evening. First, we're given the recipe for the oil. Ilvar said to Moshe, take the finest spices of liquid myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet smelling cinnamon, half as much, that is 250 and 250 of aromatic cane. 500 of Keisha, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hint of olive oil. And you shall make of these a sacred anointing oil blending, uh, blended as the, by the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. With it you shall anoint the tent of the meeting and the ark of the testimony, the table, all its utensils, the lampstand and its utensils, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils and the basin and its stand. You shall consecrate them. Uh, that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them will become holy. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may serve me as priests. And you shall say to the people of Israel, this shall be my holy anointing oil throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on the body of an ordinary person and you shall make no other like it in its composition. It is holy and it shall be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it, or whoever puts any of it on an outsider, shall be cut off from his people. Then Yehovah said to Moshe, take sweet spices, stacked in onichet, uh, galbanum, sweet spices with pure frankincense. Of each shall there be an equal part. Make an incense blended as by the perfumer, seasoned with salt, pure and holy. You shall beat some of it very small, and put part of it by, before the testimony and the tent of meeting where I shall meet with you. It shall be most holy for you. And the incense that you shall make uh, according to its composition, you shall not make for yourselves. It shall be for you holy to Yehovah. Whoever makes any like it to use as a perfume shall be cut off from his people. So the anointing oil and the incense are not to be used by ordinary people. They are holy to Yehovah. The incense is holy. It's not to be made for personal use as a perfume. The oil is, as we just read, oil blended as by the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. 
I think it's interesting that Yovar wants these fra fragrances associated with him. Doesn't want it being bandied about and used um, in profane manners. Not for profane purposes, they're set apart to him. Now, weird and wonderful facts about scent and smell. Ooh. Perfumers have to identify at least 250 smells before they can qualify. To reach the pinnacle of the perfume profession, perfumers must successfully identify at least 250 different scents as part of their induction test. This difficult initiation is why there are only 50 fully-fledged perfumers, also known as noses, in the world. <laughs> That's not it. Uh, I'm a nose. <laughs> Takes 1.6 million rose blossoms to create a kilogram of rose oil. That's insane. There are seven main smells, apparently. You know, musky, putrid, pungent, camphoraceous, similar to mothballs, ethereal, floral, and minty. And it is thought that all scents are a mixture of these seven basic ingredients. Taste is reliant on smell. <clears throat> it's no secret that the smell of food massively impacts our taste perception counting for up to 95% of the flavor. However, did you know that without a sense of smell, it would be almost impossible to tell the difference in taste between a potato and an onion? I'm not sure about that. <laughs> okay. Got a difference of opinion here. Some people think, yeah, oh, I. We can smell before we are born, apparently, but we don't smell when we're asleep. That's good, isn't it, if you're stinky? <laughs> The UK's favorite smell is freshly baked bread. Our sense of smell peaks during our late teens and during spring and summer, thanks to the additional moisture in the air. Our sense of smell improves after exercise. Women have a stronger sense of smell than men. Maybe that's why they like perfume, but... Everyone smells slightly different. I've got my old soap, haven't I? It's called Old Stinker. I certainly smell a bit different. <laughs> Our own smell is personal to us and completely unique. How we smell is predetermined. It comes from the same genes which determine our body's tissue type. I think it's interesting that Jehovah wants these smells to be particular to him. But when you smell these smells of the anointing oil and the, um, the incense... That the association was with him. Everyone can smell slightly differently too. <clears throat> we all have our scent blind spots, smells which we cannot pick up. This means that we all smell things differently and the scents we enjoy are entirely unique to us. This puts me in mind, when I was reading through all this, of what Paul says in his second letter to the Corinthians. He says, thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. We are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing to one, a fragrance from death to death to the other, a fragrance from life to life who is sufficient for these things. So I'm afraid to say that just like Paul, we all have probably more than likely got up a lot of people's noses. But not a great smell to those who are perishing. <clears throat> we are not like, this is Paul, like so many peddlers of God's word. But as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. So he says, we are not like so many peddlers of God's word. Paul, Paul points here to those who peddle Yehovah's word. He describes them as they're not sincere, nor are they commissioned by Yehovah. And he intimates that to those who are perishing, these peddlers offer neither the fragrance of salvation nor anything offensive. When you walk in the truth, you're the fragrance of salvation to those going from life to life. But you're also a completely different fragrance to those who are perishing, going from death to death. <clears throat> and I read J.C. Ryle's quote, 
There is a common worldly kind of Christianity in this day, which many have and think they have enough. It's a cheap Christianity which offends nobody and requires no sacrifice, which costs nothing and is worth nothing. And this just speaks to me of a Christianity that is, has no fragrance, not the fragrance of salvation, doesn't have the fragrance that will offend those who are perishing. It offends absolutely nobody. Um, <clears throat> And you can see, can't you, there's, in the world there is a form of Christianity that when you speak the truth, it confronts people and it challenges people and they can be offended by it. Some are challenged by it and it brings life to them as they recognize, wow, this is the truth. Some people, it's offensive and it's, what the hell is this? But there is a form of it which brings you neither salvation because it isn't the truth. It's not sincere or commissioned by God. It's given by these peddlers of God's word and it isn't offensive to the world. Like this. We've seen some of these before. Billy Graham. One of the Bible's greatest truth is that Christ died to take away all our sins, not just part of them, but all of them, past, present and future. This is the kind of thing that doesn't offend people. They like this. This is why you shouldn't fear that you will lose your salvation every time you commit a sin. If that were the case, you and I would lose our salvation every day because we sin every day. So, because we sin every day. Written flippantly like it is given that we all sin regularly. Like this is perfectly acceptable and perfectly normal. John 8, Yeshua went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst. They said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moshe commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to him to test him that they may have some charge to bring against him. Yeshua bent down, wrote with his finger on the ground. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and he said to them, let him who was without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. See, people will say, Yeshua, Jesus knows that everyone sins. Sinning is kind of expected. That's the way it is. Note that the woman was caught in the act, which means that the man must have also been present. The Torah is quite clear that in the case of adultery, both people are to be put to death, the man as well as the woman. The accusers are guilty of ignoring the clear statutes in the Torah. Everyone that sins is making a practice. Sin is, the, is uh, practicing lawlessness is the transgression of the Torah. So these people are sinning. When Yeshua asked the person who was about sin to cast the first stone, no one responds. The accusers are guilty of a travesty of justice. They have violated the Torah by condemning the woman's sin while letting the other party go free. This is not Yeshua saying, come on, everyone sins. It's cool. Once more he bent down, he wrote on the ground, and when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Yeshua was left alone with the woman standing before him. Yeshua stood up to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, O Lord. And Yeshua said, neither do I condemn you. Go, sin is not that big a deal. That is not what he said. He said, no, no one, Lord. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Now, I'm putting these ex examples in because um, I think some people actually think more along the lines of what the peddlers of God's word would put out there. The likes of what we see here, this quote from Billy Graham. They don't have a sense that there's anything particularly wrong in it aren't really interested in the business of purifying themselves. They might have got baptized and stuff, and from that moment on, what have they done? They've gradually wandered back to the mire, and sin isn't a big deal to them. Again, from the article. What's up? We did, okay. Okay, let me get my glasses. I, my eyes are stuff bad. I can't actually read them. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Oh. 
Oh. What am I doing? I can't do anything. What am I doing? There we go. JP just pointed out that we actually got an email from Billy Graham Ministries the other day. Shall I read it all? Okay. 68 years later, praying God will move in the UK again. This is from Billy Graham Ministries. <clears throat> Something rare and powerful is coming to Great Britain. More than 2,600 churches have been preparing, praying, and waiting for this moment. In 1954, a thousand churches supported Billy Graham's Greater London Crusade and thousands of lives were changed. This year, uh, churches will take part in another large evangelistic outreach sharing the best news. God loves you and you can, and you can live with him forever and in heaven. <laughs> okay. This is... Uh, right. <clears throat> yeah, this is what we're talking about. This is this gospel which is um, just not offensive to the world. It's what everybody wants to hear. But sadly, it's got no stink to those who are perishing, but neither does it offer them salvation. He's going to um, go on his God Loves You tour. The gospel-focused outreach will kick off in Liverpool. Okay. Oh, that's good. <laughs> well, I won't read much more of it. Yeah, it's exactly the kind of thing that we're on about. But <clears throat> I'll move on. Nice to know that they're thinking about it. <laughs> okay, so he says, doesn't he? He says, um, this is why you shouldn't fear um, that you will lose your salvation every time you commit a sin. Okay. The translation of that is obviously um, once saved, always saved. When we come back to this. If after you've escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, um, Yeshua HaMashiach, they're again entangled in them and overcome. The last states become worse than the first. It would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from my holy commandment, the, the holy commandment delivered to them. Completely destroys all of that argument, all of that nonsense that the peddlers of God's word want to put out there. What the true proverb says has happened is the dog returns to his own vomit and the sow that is washed returns to wallow in the mire. Disgraced, defiled, filthy, but apparently that's okay. No worries, I'm coated with Jesus' forgiveness is the attitude. And of course, this is something that, you know, people, they won't admit to thinking that's how they feel, but their life choices actually suggest that they actually think this is, this is where it's at. People who are still counting themselves as his people. And it's total and utter nonsense. What makes us perfect is not what we do, but what Jesus did on our behalf. His infinite perfection cannot be stained by our imperfections. Some people will hear this and they'll go, oh, this is brilliant. That means I can pretty much do whatever I want. So no matter what we do, we're perfect because Jesus is, is effectively what it's saying. So there's nothing expected of us. We don't have to do anything whatsoever. Although we read in Revelation 19, his wife has made herself ready. It was granted to her that she be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. She's made herself ready, but I thought you didn't have to do it. And then we read, if you've put our trust, this is from another article of life, if we have put our trust in Jesus we can be confident that sins from our past, our present, and our future are forgiven, all because of the perfection of Jesus' sacrifice. This is also being put out there as a, basically like a, just do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. It's all okay. Is it true we can do whatever we want uh, since all our future sins are forgiven? People behave like this is the truth. They might sit and nod and go, oh, that's just, oh, that's nonsense, isn't it? But it'll be people who actually watch this teaching, people who actually call themselves Torah keepers, people who 
think it's actually okay, really, to sin and just bend Jehovah's word and, yeah, but it's not that big a deal, is it? Because they still hold on to some of this nonsense. From the peddlers of God's word, we read at the beginning of the Parsha that we're warned to watch. And one of the things we're to watch for is this nonsense. We live in a world which is a very casual attitude towards sin. We have a world full of churches that have a very casual attitude towards sin. It's even in my lifetime I can see such a remarkable change in attitude of people. Like things that would have been shocking like when I was a young lad. And now kind of, well, everybody, it's, not, it's normal now. And they'll even state the date. 2022, you know. Like, oh, 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 get, yeah, yeah, sorry. Even many who claim to walk in the truth of the very casual attitude towards sin. Like it isn't really a big deal. It's okay to sin because Yeshua, that's effectively what you're saying. But was Yeshua cool about sin? Did he think it was like, hey, don't worry about it? Did he say, don't sweat it? Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. Parallel verse, Mark 9. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. So effectively, he's saying, look, if you've got sin in your life, how do you think this is going to work out for you? Eternal fire, the hell, uh, the fire of hell. Seems that Yeshua takes sin a little more seriously than most of the folk, folk that claim to follow him. Let me move on. <clears throat> We've seen this before, and it is ridiculous, but it's worth looking at. The super hydrophobic coating repels almost any liquid. There you go. <clears throat> this was used in an article, again, talking about how great it is to be a Christian. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is like that for us. When a person receives his gift of forgiveness, condemnation for all sin just rolls right off, past, present, and future. It has nothing to do with the material of the person who is coated by Jesus' forgiveness. It has everything to do with the perfection of what they are coated with, the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ. We read it earlier. Don't be deceived. He who practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. All sin just rolls off. We're coated with the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ. With regards to the blood of the Messiah, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth, the truth, the word that we're supposed to be sanctified in, John 17, 17. The word is truth. But if we walk in the light, which is an idiom for walking in the word, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Yeshua, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So if we walk in the light, that is in accordance with his word, then we can be cleansed of all sin. Now I stuck my hand up in a church once and said, oh yeah, and I'm all for a bit of that. I want to go to heaven. Or not this. I'm a Torah keeper now. Pronounce myself a Torah keeper. I've been baptized. I've gone back to the mire a bit. Yeah, but it's okay. I mostly do the word, but I've, I've, I've allowed a few things, you know, a bit of sin. That's okay, isn't it? I cannot say that I am justified in Christ and continue in sin. Romans 2. It is not the hearers of the Lord who are righteous. Not sitting there hearing it and going, oh yeah, nodding your head before God. But the doers of the Lord who will be justified, who will be made right. It's the doers of the Torah, not the hearers only, who have turned from doing things their own way to doing things according to Yehovah's will, his word. It is these who have truly repented and died to self, to Christ, uh, died to self that the Messiah might live. These are the ones who are justified. And this is all about whether or not you're humble or not. Anyone can sit there and nod and go, yeah, that's right, that's right, that. But then when it actually comes to it, they just won't bend the knee. They just want to do things their way, which is what most people are like, sadly. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. I don't know how anyone can sit and listen to these words and think that it's okay to continue with sin in your life, to just kind of like gloss over it a bit. I don't know, to have your imaginary super coating on, 
So have your imaginary nonsense in your head that it's all right, actually. Little children, let no one deceive you. We just mentioned it. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as Yeshua is righteous. Let no one deceive you. People will happily let themselves be deceived sometimes in order to justify sin in their lives. And sadly, in doing that, they are not justified before Yehovah. Righteousness, in case we forget what righteousness is, careful to do the commandments before Yehovah as he commanded. My tongue will sing of your word for all your commandments are right or righteous. Galatians 6, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows that he will reap. The one who sows to his own flesh from the flesh will reap corruption. The one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. What is this flesh in spirit? Flesh, to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Yeah. The mind that is set in the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. It resists. Again, this is a case of lack of humility. And the warning was, therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Have a look. See. If you do not take heed, there's a danger that you might fall, a call for serious vigilance. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil, to leave all that behind. He who watches his way, who is careful in the way he walks, preserves his life. Later in his letter, we read, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. There is absolutely no word in Scripture that tells you that you can just crack on as ever you please in the mire, in the filth, and that it will go well for you. We have seen that the word corrects us when we get off course. It's valuable. It is so profitable to come and hear the word. We are to be mindful to continue on in it. Just as Paul told Timothy, continue in what you've learned and believed. Lest, as we've just seen, you will have believed in vain. Strive to enter through the narrow door. Many, I tell you, will seek to enter and not be able. Why? Because they have just... They haven't been vigilant. They've just been deceived into this notion that everything's going to work out okay for them. Because it's them. Philippians 2, therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now, not only is my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Again, this is not about obeying to impress somebody to put on a show. This is about being completely and utterly submitted, humble before Jehovah. Put on the armor, walk in accordance with the word, stand and pray. Watch and pray. Hold fast to Yehovah. Hold fast to the word. We're called to be vigilant. It is valuable to take the time to sit and listen to the word of Yehovah. It is good to concern ourselves with holding fast to it. Again, we see the peddlers giving us something. What makes us perfect is not what we do, but what Jesus did on our behalf. His infinite perfection cannot be stained by our imperfections. Okay. <clears throat> he can say, well, yeah. What you do is, it's not, he's not going to come across, nobody's going to look at him and say, well, he's, he's, look, Yeshua is no longer perfect. But what this is couched in such a way as to say is, you can do pretty much what you want. And the Lord's going to look at you and go, you're perfect, you. It's so horrible. And it's so arrogant. When I think about what Christianity is, it's, the, it's, it's probably the most arrogant religion in the world. It's this idea that the God of all creation, he kind of has to answer to you, really. It's, it's just awful. It's totally awful. Really, really. I can, but you can see why it appeals to people because nothing's asked of them. It doesn't challenge them. So no matter what we do, we're perfect before Jesus. Cool, we don't have to worry about becoming blemished or stained. And sadly, there's many people who claim to walk in the truth. Yeah, it doesn't really matter what we do because I say I'm a Torah keeper and I follow Jesus and I, 
I've got some seat seats on in it. I'll make challah bread on the Sabbath. <laughs> but it's all nonsense. Just like the priests in the earthly tabernacle who were fully immersed when ordained, yet washed daily in the water of the bronze basin, the laver, we also need to be taking care to continually be washed in the water in the word. Baptism is all about dying to self-repentance and appeal to Yehovah for a good conscience, cleansing from sin. From this point on, we've been cleansed, but it doesn't end there. We are to continue to be cleansed, unstained, by immersing ourselves in the water of the word. And to wash in the water of the word is to apply the word to your life. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God is to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Keep oneself unstained. That's just not something that people who like to hear the peddlers of God's word want to consider. 1 John 3, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God and so we are. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Remember what Yeshua said, it's the sons who shall go free. These are the ones who are truly blessed. And it's these who purify themselves. We read, whoever is born of God does not commit sin. They don't commit sin and make themselves filthy. They purify themselves. The price that was required for your head to be counted as one of the children of Israel, the children of the promise, a son or a daughter of Yehovah, the price that was paid at Golgotha, that price was paid at Golgotha. And if you want to be counted as one of the sons that go free, you take up your cross, you follow him to the place called Golgotha. You lay down your life that you might live. Baptism, going under the water, this is what it is. Dying to self and repentance. But I'll say it again, it does not end there. The people, these ones who were the sons of Yehovah, they purify themselves. I'm aware of the fact that there's so many people uh, who have all these ideas of what the word's about and where they're standing is with Yehovah. And a lot of it is absolute nonsense. If you want to purify yourself, you need to be washed in the water of the word. The word, which is like a mirror, just as the laver was made from the mirrors of the women. And you need to really take a look at yourself and see where you're really at. Yeshua said to him, he that is washed, okay, completely bathed, completely clean as represented by the baptism, need not to wash, save his feet. Okay, this is obviously this washing of oneself, we see represented by the bronze laver. To wash his feet is to walk according to the word. It's right the way through scripture. And for those who have been washed, you ask yourself, what will you do? Will you continue in what you have believed? Will you walk according to the word? Or will you return like a sow to wallowing in the mire? Lots of people do. Will you listen to those who peddle Yehovah's word, those who are not sincere nor commissioned by Yehovah, those offering neither the fragrance of salvation nor anything offensive, those who appropriate what is holy and profane it? Will you take what is holy and profane it? Weird and wonderful facts. Good smells make us happy. Proverbs 27 actually backs this up. It says, oil and perfume make the heart glad, so a man's counsel is sweet to his friend. Smell is our most memorable sense. It has been discovered that we remember smells for much longer than sight, sounds, tastes, and feelings. Amazingly, people can remember smells with a 65% accuracy after a year whilst visual recall is only 50-50 after a quarter of the time. Smell is memorable. We strongly associate smells with places, people, and experiences. So let us come back to the instructions for the anointing oil and the incense. The incense for the Mishkan is holy and not to be made for personal use as a perfume. 
It's to be strongly associated with Jehovah. The oil is oil blended as by the perfume. It shall be a holy anointing oil. Interesting that Jehovah wants these fragrances associated with him. They are not to be used for profane purposes. And I was thinking about this as well. I was thinking about the ingredients that make these things up. And how all these ingredients can be found on the earth. And I was just thinking, wow, and that's the smell that Jehovah wants associated with him. And it's not some like really obscure thing, you know, like... He didn't send something down from heaven to add some bizarre ingredients to be associated with them or anything like that. And it just gave me the sense of that when we, when we finally get to be in his presence and get to meet him, that there will be a sense of something really familiar to us. It won't be like this completely alien experience as it were. I don't know why, but I just thought that was really comforting. Um, but yeah, this smell is not to be used for any profane purpose. These things are set apart to him. They are holy. What happens when we take something that Jehovah identifies with and we seek to use it for our own purposes? He will say to the people of Israel, this shall be my holy anointing oil throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on the body of an ordinary person. You shall make no other like it in composition. It is holy. It should be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it or whoever puts any of it on an outsider shall be cut off from his people. And the incense that you make according to its composition, you shall not make for yourselves. It shall be for you holy to Jehovah. Whoever makes any like it to use as a perfume shall be cut off from his people. And I think there's an important principle at play here. Taking something holy that Jehovah once identified with him and making it profane, making it common. I'm sure we've all felt that horrible wretching inside when we hear sinners quote the Bible out of context in order to justify wicked lifestyle choices. Most prevalent example I've come across is judge not lest you be judged. And it's weird. I always find it really odd. The people who are atheists, you can almost see if they can ever try to bit a bit of scripture out of context, usually. But they'd get a bit of scripture and they can use that as part of their argument. They're so delighted. It's almost like, see, I am right. It's like <laughs> they're admitting without knowing it that they recognize that the Bible is actually the word of God, that it is actually the truth. But you'll see people in the world using this judge, not lest you be judged. And it's awful words that Yeshua spoke with regards to hypocrisy. It isn't a mantra in order to dispel all criticism and justify sinful living. Imagine how Yehovah feels about having his word used in such a profane way by those of the world. These people bandying his word about in such a way. I reckon it must annoy him. And what do you imagine he feels about those who peddle his word? Those who claim to be teaching about who he is? We see, Paul tells us, how we are to view these people. There are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But if we are an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. So we've said before, I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. And we've looked at this. It's anathema. There you go. Devoted to destruction. Um, harem in the Hebrew. Doomed. An object dedicated. Should be utterly destroyed. An abomination. Paul likens those preaching another gospel. The peddlers of Yehovah's word. Those who are not sincere. Those who are not commissioned by Yehovah. So that which is the association in Scripture, something to be utterly detested, utterly abhorred, something to be destroyed. There is no situation in which it is acceptable to profane what is holy, as we've just read. Whoever compounds any like it, whoever puts any of it on an outsider, should be cut off from his people. Talking about the oils and the incense, whoever makes any like it, uses a perfume, should be cut off from his people. It's really serious. Imagine how Yehovah feels about having his word used in a profane way by those who profess to walk in the truth. 
those who are happy to listen to those who peddle his word. Those who are happy to be again entangled, yet in need of justification of their lifestyle choices. The Lord said, stand by the roads, look and ask for the ancient path. The people said, we're not going to walk in, I'm not going to do that. We'll find something new, some new kind of thing that'll just, it'll all be okay. People who go out of their way to twist scriptures in order to sin. There's people like this, this right the way throughout the history of Jehovah's people. Many who appoint themselves as teachers of the word in order to get them to say what they want to. We're all teachers, I'm not listening to him. And I think it says this. I want it to say this. It tells them what they want to hear because they've distorted it. They themselves have become peddlers of the word. And they get neither salvation from it nor offense. It's not going to offend them anymore because they've shaped it to be what they want it to be. But neither are they going to get salvation. They have made it profane. Paul would say, let him be accursed. Now next in our partial, we have the mention of Bezalel and a whole a whole up of Bezalel. Why can't I find his name so hard to see? Bezalel. Jehovah says, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship. Behold, I have appointed with him a holy ab, the son of Ahishimach, out of the tribe of Dan, and I have given to all men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you, the Mishkan and all its furnishings and utensils. Jehovah knows how to bring the right people along to build his temple. Just as he knows how to bring along people today to build his tabernacle, to build his spiritual house. People who are sincere, people who have been appointed by Jehovah, people who will speak his truth, who will not take what is holy and profane it. We have next in our portion mention of the Sabbath. Jehovah said to Moshe, You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. So for anybody out there who thinks it's not that important, it is. You shall say, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and throughout your generations, me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I, Jehovah, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Again, don't take what is holy and profane it. Whoever does any work in it, that soul should be cut off from among his people. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel. And in six days, Jehovah made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. Next in our Parsha, we read, He gave to Moshe, when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. And when the people saw that Moshe delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moshe, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears, and they brought them to Aaron. So Jehovah gave Moshe instructions for taking a free will offering to be used in the making of the tabernacle. We saw that in Exodus 25. Here, Aaron takes a collection, an offering of gold to make an idol. In the commentary, Guzik wrote, by nature, people are generous in what they give to their idols. And I think that's really a pertinent point. Most people in the world fashion gods for themselves to turn to the gods um, and idols that they are presented with in the culture they grow up in. And in the modern day, they do not even realize that this is what they're doing. Nothing has really changed. It's always been the same. Silver and gold, i.e. the things that a materialistic world holds valuable, turned into something for people to offer their devotion to. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Well, this is your Elohim. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation, and he said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to Jehovah. Fascinating aspect of this whole debacle. Again, nothing has really changed. It's always been the same. 
The world of the religious types carrying Yehovah's name is full of people doing their own thing, building their own little calf god and ascribing Yehovah's name to it. Now, regarding deceit and idolatry, we read in Deuteronomy 11, Take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Take care. Again, watch, be vigilant. Being deceived and serving other gods is something we see those who profess to be Yehovah's servants doing throughout time. The warning against being deceived is one that we read not just in the Old Testament, but also a lot in the New Testament. Take care lest your heart be deceived and you go after other gods. Colossians 2, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Don't listen to all that garbage, that, like the stuff we went through before. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, and all effeminate, nor abusers themselves with mankind. 1 Timothy 3.13 Evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. No wonder we're given these warnings. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Same list. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man reaps, he should sow. Please note it's an issue of the heart. Take care lest your heart be deceived. Charlie, can you hear that? The dog, Charlie, that I'm not talking to myself again. I have to point that out. <laughs> talking about myself in the third person. <laughs> I'm just scratching his head now. He seems happy. Leviticus 19. Do not turn to idols or make for yourselves any gods of cast metal. I am Yehovah, your God. Turn here is not shu from where we get to shu or repentance. The word is pana, root word of panim or face. We're being told not to turn our faces or attention towards these gods of our own making. Yehovah states that he is our God. We're not to go after any other. In that word, alil, idols, good for nothing. Useless, worthless, absolute trash. So your Torah keeper is not going to bow down and kiss a doll of baby Jesus, though, is he? Like we see in uh, this little bit here. It's not going to do that. Your Torah keeper is not going to do that. But for some, when there are aspects of the word that challenge them, things that they're not comfortable with, they seek to twist the word to find somebody that will peddle the word, to them, the word to them in an inoffensive and ineffective way. If you consider that the word is who Yehovah is, it just speaks of is it him. To tamper with it is to create your own God. And that's what so many people are apt to do. But we read, you shall have no other gods before me. Shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, that is under the water, under the earth. Shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, Yehovah, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the, gener of the, on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So to go after other gods is to hate Yehovah. But for all the people who seek to tamper with his word, Yehovah looks at them and just says, you hate me. To love him is to keep his commandments. Idolaters hate Yehovah, as will be evidenced by the disobedience. According to the second word, those who go after false gods hate Yehovah, and those who hate him do not keep his commandments. And they are not the children of God, because they continue on with sin in their lives. Back to Exodus 32, they rose up early on the morrow, don't know what happened to me picture, um, and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. In 1 Corinthians 10, now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. So we come back to what we read earlier. Do not buy idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Keen. They rose up to do it. They were keen. They were mad keen. This is great. We like this. Let's make our own God, but let's put Yehovah's name on it. That's what we want to do. Don't indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did. 23,000 fell in a single day. For anybody out there who might be seduced, led by the desires of their flesh, to invent themselves a little calf God and ascribing Yehovah's name to it, 
a God who's not so bothered about the fact that they're actually sinning. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did. They were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer, referencing our soul loathes this light bread. Don't be like one of these either. The word not being enough for you, looking for something else, the next fix, or something that just, oh, it just titillates in some kind of a way. If we look again at the first verse of chapter 32, we can see something interesting. And it says that Moshe delayed, and the word is bush. The Hebrew word for delayed is a term that actually implies that Moshe had disappointed them. We see this here. They had their own ideas of how long he should be up there on the mountain. And remember, Moshe is an idiom for the Torah. He delayed. It didn't happen when he didn't come back when he wanted to. It didn't happen in their time, what they thought. And it's just the same attitude, isn't it, as those who say, our soul loads this bread. How many Torah keepers get disappointed by Moshe, by the Torah? They need something else. Uh, they need to add their own take or find a new focus. They end up discontent and bickering and investing themselves in whatever diversion takes their fancy. They bring their gold earrings, as it were. Let's build something here. Hey, presto, they end up with a golden calf and they ascribe Yehovah's name to it. Again, it's, it's, it's really prevalent and it's... Um, it's all about the attitude that's in their heart. They never truly fell in love with Jehovah and who he is. They're mad keen. They rise up early to play and make a lot of noise and inevitably attract other people who perhaps are also a bit disappointed in motion and Torah and are looking for something new, the next fix. And what they end up with is worthless. Good for nothing. 1 Peter 2.5 you yourselves, like living stones, are built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Yeshua HaMashiach. As I said before, just as he was able to bring together these craftsmen and he enabled them for the building of his house, so he's able to do it today. We are supposed to be built up together to bring spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Yehovah. What is acceptable to Yehovah is that which is prescribed in his word. So I ask, is the manner enough for you? Are you disappointed in his word? And again, it's not something you'd say, but it's something that's evidenced by the things that you pursue, where you put your attentions. The sacred writings, the Torah, which are able to make you wise through salvation, through faith in Christ Jesus. Yeah, I just need a bit more. No, you don't. Profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The laver made of mirrors, the water representing the word, will you walk in accordance with all it says? Will you be corrected? Okay, teaser, part three. This is good, isn't it? No technical hitches today, even though it's still not properly fixed. So Exodus 32 continued. The Lord said to Moshe, get down, uh, go get down. I'll say that again, go get thee down for thy people which you brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They've turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They've made a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moshe, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people, not humble people. Now therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I'll make of you a great nation. So I'll get rid of them, Moses, and I'll start with you. So Moshe could say, uh, so if I don't leave you alone, you won't do it? Is that how it's working? Jehovah is doing this for Moshe for his benefit, for him to grow. He wants Moshe to see the opportunity to forsake the Israelites and become the progenitor of the bloodline and to decide against it and say, no, that's not the way it should be. There's something about Moshe actually making the decision that is different to knowing that he would have made the decision because Moshe himself benefits from it spiritually. And the Yehovah will often lead us through events that will grow us, that will conform us to be the image of his son. Moshe besought Yehovah his God and he said, Why does your wrath wax hot against your people, which you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? 
There are two different forms of why. There's an inquiry about the causality of a situation. Why has this happened? What caused it? And why in terms of future tense, as in for what purpose? Motion is not saying why are you mad at these people? Like, what's the big deal? He clearly can understand why it, uh, Yehovah would be mad. He's not saying, oh, they were just having a bit of fun. There's no reason to get over excited. Moshe gets how awful it is, and he makes a plea for grace. He says, why should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and repent of this evil against your people. Remember Isaac, uh, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Israel, thy servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of, I will give to your seed, and I shall inherit it forever. So Mrs. Amani knew the character or the name, should we say, of Yehovah. He appeals on the basis of three things that Yehovah said or will say. Yehovah's promises of salvation, Yehovah's name being profaned amongst the nations. What will they think if you do this? So he just dragged them out into the wilderness to kill them. And Yehovah's word to the patriarchs. Moshe calls on the character of Yehovah. Again, Yehovah knew what the outcome would be. He was teaching Moshe through these events about who he is. About who he is. Yehovah al ra The Lord repented in the camp of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. The camp, the Hebrew word that forms the verb root of Yenichem does not mean or imply repentance or changing. The can means to have compassion, to give comfort, or to be consoled. And Moshe turned, he went down the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, the front and on the back they were written. So he has this um, word from the Lord that the people have done wrong. So he knows it's not good, and he heads down with the tablets. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moshe, there is a noise of war in the camp. He said, it is not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, the sound of singing that I hear. And it came to pass as soon as he came near to the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moshe's anger waxed hot. He'd been pre-warned as well, by the way. And yet, when he's actually confronted with it, his anger waxed hot and he cast the tablets out of his hands and he broke them beneath the mount. And Moshe said to Aharon, what did this people do to you that you've brought such a great sin upon them? Let me have the worst excuse of it. Aaron says, I said to them, whosoever has any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me and I cast it into the fire and there came out this calf. It's just mind-boggling, really, isn't it? And as I've said before to the people, it's, you can look at it and just go, well, that's just ridiculous. But often case, people will make excuses for their forms of idolatry and going after the wrong things that are equally as ridiculous. And they somehow expect people to go, oh, okay then. We see in Exodus 32, 4, he fashioned with it a graving tool and made a golden calf. He actually made it. didn't just come out, obviously. Aaron's sin was so great that, as mentioned earlier, only the intercession of Moshe saved his life. Yehovah was angry with Aharon and would have destroyed him, so I prayed for Aaron at the same time. And when Moshe saw the people were naked or unrestrained, for Aaron had made them naked, for Aaron had not restrained them unto their shame among their enemies, we can read here that there's no greater danger than for people to cast off all restraint. Let's just go mad, do whatever seems right in their own eyes. Indeed, the darkest days of Israel's history, characterized by this phrase, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And if you read the book of Judges, you'll see the debacle that creates. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And sadly, so many people are apt to do the same thing, to cast off all restraints and do what seems right in their own eyes. Trust in Yehovah with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. 
In all your ways acknowledge him, he will make straight your paths. But most people refuse to be humble before you hover. They want to do things their way. They want a God that lets them do it their way. It's the same kind of attitude behind those who don't want to um, really sit under any authority that Jehovah has established, who want to make the word say what they want it to say. Because actually what's going on is in their heart there's a lack of humility. Now, William Bullock Sr., I um, a quote from him every now and again. He says, The truth is that there is something about fallen man that will always, if given a choice, choose a God that he can mold himself according to his own tastes. Such a God, you see, man can manipulate and control. To such a God, man is not in any meaningful way accountable. Such a God is always easier to serve than Yehovah, whom we cannot manipulate or control, and to whom we are accountable for every thought, attitude, opinion, word, and deed. A handmade God is therefore, to the basic instincts of man, much more palatable than the true God. A calf God is, after all, a much more convenient God. A calf God that can be served any way we want, any time we want, if we want. A calf God lets us hold meetings that are all about us and what we like and call it worship. A calf God does not confront us over lukewarmness or complacency, does not discipline us when we neglect our calling. Verse 76, Moshe stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come to him. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves to him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. Please note that Aaron and his sons had already been chosen to be priests. People often, this instance that we're going to read about here, say, this is what made them become priests for God, the um, golden calf incident. They were already appointed to be priests. Their appointment has nothing to do with the golden calf sin. After all, who was credited with making the calf? Verse 35, Aaron. Before the golden calf incident, we actually read, Then bring, you, bring near to you Aharon in Exodus 28, your brother, and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests. Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eliata, and Ithamar. So what transpires is the children of Levi did according to the word of Moshe, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. So they went through, and they did slay them. For Moshe has said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. See, consecrate. They did become priests then. Okay, consecrate is more, more like um, and if we look at this word here, <clears throat> primitive root, to fill or to be full of. The word translated consecrate means to be fill or full of. We see it here in its different uses. The call here from Moshe is to be fully <clears throat> for Jehovah. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moshe said unto the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. Moshe returned to the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and they have made gods of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, and if not, and then he says this, if you're not going to forgive them, blot me, I pray, out of your book which you have written, which is quite a remarkable prayer. The book, okay, Revelation 20. I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. But Moshe is saying here, block me out of your book if you're not going to forgive them. Which is, you know, that's about as remarkable as it gets. That's, that's even beyond, just kill me. Now this is, block me out your book, or I'll be destroyed. And the Lord said to Moshe, whoever has sinned against me, him I will blot out of my book. So there's just in itself as a statement um, for anyone who thinks they can just continue on in sin in their lives and it's all going to be okay. We read before <clears throat> Yeshua talking to the 17th sent out who came back, made up that they cast demons out of people. He said, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is about the biggest deal ever. 
that your names will be written in heaven. And Yeshua says, this is a real reason to rejoice. We read in Revelation 3, you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments. They haven't returned back to the mire. And they walk with me in white, for they are worthy. These are people who purify themselves. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. If we want to be considered worthy and not have our names blotted, blotted out of the book of life, then we must be clean. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white for fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. All the way through scripture, there's this call for righteousness. Let thy priest be clothed with righteousness and let these priests, uh, thy saints shout for joy. Let them rejoice. These are the people whose names are written in the book of life. And continue in Exodus, therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoke to thee. Behold, my angel shall go before thee. This is, just, this is Jehovah speaking now. He says, nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. So, <clears throat> didn't go very well for them, did it? And the Lord said to Moshe, depart and go up hence, you and the people which you have brought up out of the land of Egypt. Um, unto the land which I swore to Abraham, to Yitzhak, and to Yaakov, saying, Unto thy seed I will give it. It's interesting, isn't it? He says, Which you brought up out of the land. It's like the Lord's distance itself from the people. He says, And I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for you're a stiff necked people, lest I consume you in the way. Um, not a great thing to be hearing, is it? But look at the reason. It's because they're stiff-necked. This lack of humility which led them into idolatry, as it does today for so many. They want to ascribe Yehovah's name to their own little God that they want to create. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man did put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moshe, saying to the children of Israel, you are stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee that I may know what to do to thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. What we actually have here is it represents um, them repenting to a certain extent. Acts 26 we read, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God. And this phrase, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Repent and turn to God. Performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Most of what passes as repentance has nothing to do with Yehovah. The modern Western world concept of repentance has little to do with dying to self and turning to Yehovah to walk in his ways. It's more to do with making the person feel better by relieving his or her feelings of guilt. I've witnessed it loads of times. Um, it's awful. Um, it's just such a nonsense. It's such theatre. Um, it doesn't mean anything. To repent is to actually turn. To actually just say, no, that's not for me anymore. Not to keep messing with it and dabbling with it. As we said before, walking back to the mire, have a little mess around. True repentance is something far beyond and much deeper than sorry. It's unconditionally surrendered to Yehovah. And then again, it comes down to humbling yourself before him. The essential final step of repentance is actually facing the exact same temptation to which you yielded before, this time making a different decision. By stripping themselves of the golden earrings and jewelry so recently used to make a golden calf, they returned precisely to the place where they had sinned in stripping off their gold in order to make it God. So if you do recognize in your life that there are things you need to repent of. That doesn't mean I'm sorry. That means turning away completely from it. Exodus 33. Moshe used uh, to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. This is not the 
um, tabernacle that will be built. And everyone who saw Yehovah would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moshe went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moshe until he had gone into the tent. And when Moshe entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent and Yehovah would speak with Moshe. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each other's tent door. Thus, Yehovah used to speak to Moshe face to face as a man speaks to his friend. I think this is remarkable. But these people witnessed all this. Um, and yet, still, we will find them capable of rebellion, capable of wanting to go back to Egypt, capable of trying to usurp Moshe and the authority that Jehovah has given him. And... Um, we see here this incredible bit where it says, Yehovah used to speak to Moshe face to face as a man speaks to his friend. That's just incredible, isn't it? As I put there, how amazing. And the verse continues and says, when Moshe turned again into the camp, this is something that is often lost. His assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man would not depart from the tent. He stayed there. Moshe would go back into the camp. He'd have his experience here would, and Joshua would stay at this tent you see Joshua would have spent much time in Jehovah's presence uh, if you're more interested and want to learn more about Joshua we did uh, four teachings on the book of Joshua which you can see on the website Moshe then intercedes for the people and then he makes a request Moshe said please show me your glory this is Moshe who speaks face to face with Jehovah. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, Jehovah. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and show mercy upon whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. Okay. It's an odd phrase. He says, I will have mercy on whom I will um, show mercy. Uh, it's not an arbitrary phrase. We read in Daniel 9. I pray to Jehovah my God and make confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love, mercy with those who love him and keep his commandments. Which is another one for all those people who think, and they do, they wouldn't maybe admit to it, but they have this idea that God's got to forgive them. I don't know why, because they said they love Jesus or something, but God's got to forgive them. And again, it's this arrogance that's really... Uh, like all throughout Christendom. But the Lord actually has mercy on who, those who love him and keep his commandments. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand um, on the rock. Interesting, it mentions the rock. Paul refers to the rock as Yeshua. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of a rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. And Yehovah said to Moshe, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone, like the first, and I will write in the tablets the words that were on the first tablet, which you broke. Be ready by the morning and come up in the mountain to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite the mountain. So Moshe cut two tablets of stone like the first and he rose early in the morning. He's keen. He's keen to go and do what Yehovah's bidding is. He rose early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as Yehovah had commanded him. And he took the two tablets of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And in scripture, your name, Yeshem, is much more than just the title you know by. It's a description of the essence of a person. Yehovah passed before him and proclaimed, Yehovah, um, Yehovah Elohim, merciful, and the word is Reham, compassionate, gracious, long-suffering, and abundance in kindness. I said a word we've looked at before, and truth. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. So Yehovah's chesed does not compromise his integrity or justice. He still punishes sin. 
However, he is compelled to show mercy, delay punishment, forgive iniquity, transgression, and sin, because this is his character. Yehovah wants us to know him as merciful and gracious and slow to anger. He wants us to know him as a forgiving, faithful, and just, and careful to give opportunity for repentance. But repentance is not saying you're sorry and going back to the mire. Repentance is turning from the thing. Isaiah 30, in returning, shuva and rest, you shall be saved. And in quietness and in confidence and trust um, shall be your strength. And the word is Victor related to safety and security. Moshe had made haste and he bowed his head towards the earth and he worshipped. And he said, if now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people. Pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. He says, take care lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become a snare in your midst. So Jehovah gives his warnings. Shall tear down their altars, break down their pillars, and cut down their asherim. For you shall worship no other God, for Jehovah, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. You shall, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their God, and you're invited, you eat of his sacrifice. And you take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods. And yet, we know that the people did go after other gods. As we read earlier, he, King Uzziah, did what was right in the eyes of Jehovah, according to all that David, his father, had done. He removed the high places, broke down the pillars, and cut down the ashes. What were they doing there? It's because the people didn't hearken to the word of Jehovah. He broke the bronze serpent that Moshe had made. They even took that and made that into a, uh, an idol. And what did he do, though? He held fast the back to Jehovah. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that Jehovah commanded Moshe. As we saw earlier, likewise, those who survived the incident of Shittim, where many were destroyed for idolatry, uh, were those who held fast to Jehovah. They went off. They were in no man's land. And we read earlier, take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Take care. This is an active thing. Take care. Watch. We see it all the way through Scripture. Yeshua says it. Watch. Hold fast. How do we take care? How do we know we won't be in danger of being deceived and running after false gods? By holding fast. We read it in Deuteronomy 13, 4. Walk after Jehovah your God. Fear him. Keep his commandments. Obey his voice. Hold fast to him. By fearing him, Shemar and his commandments, and shimahing his voice. That's how we keep ourselves from being deceived and going after false gods. And when Joshua addressed Israel, he made it clear what it means to cling to Yehovah. He said, be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moshe, turning aside from it neither to the left, uh, to the right hand nor to the left. And it's sad, isn't it? Because so many people... They read and they're even champion and cheer and stuff, but they actually do exactly that. They turn aside, a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, whatever it might be. They just veer off. You may not mix with those nations remaining among you, and the names of their gods shall not be named among you, neither shall you serve them or bow down to them. But you shall cling to Jehovah your God just as you've done this day. So, effectively. Don't go returning back to the vomit. Don't go back to the mire. The call is to be very strong, to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the Lord of Moses. As we read earlier in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, you're being saved if you hold fast to the word that I preached you, unless you believed in vain. Finishing the Parsha, we read this. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib. In the month of Abib, the Hodesh, you came out from Egypt. <clears throat> and he says, all that opened the womb are mine, all your male livestock, the firstborn of cow and sheep. The firstborn of a donkey shall redeem with a lamb, or if you do not redeem it, it shall break its neck. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. We looked at this about two weeks ago. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest in plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. You keep the Sabbath, 
even in the busiest times, you keep the Sabbath. You shall observe the Feast of Weeks, the first fruits of wheat's harvest, and the Feast of Ingathering at the year's end. Three times in the year shall all your males appear before the Lord God of Israel. For I will cast out nations before you, enlarge your borders. No one shall covet your land when you go up to appear before Jehovah your God three times in the year. And he says, you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened. Well, let the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover remain until the morning. The best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring to the house of Jehovah your God. And you shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And Jehovah said to Moshe, write these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with Jehovah forty days and forty nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. He wrote on the tablets of the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And Moshe came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. As he came down from the mountain, Moshe did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. I think this is amazing. <laughs> and he didn't know. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> I just think it's cool. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moshe, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. <laughs> he, he's probably like, what's going on here? What's the problem? <laughs> but Moshe called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moshe talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that Jehovah had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moshe had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Okay. Must have been pretty shiny, this face. <laughs> Whenever Moshe went in before Jehovah to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out, told the people of Israel what was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moshe, that the skin of Moshe's face was shining. And Moshe would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. Again, I'm amazed. These are the people who will go on to rebel to hanker after the things of Egypt and it just reminds me of people who you've seen <clears throat> the Torah represented by Moshe they've seen how incredible it is how radiating of light it is or you might want to pull just how awesome it is and yet they go on to nonsense absolute nonsense it's just because that's what's in their hearts. So we come to this <clears throat> old lady says, Hello, Jane, how's your belly? I haven't seen her in a while. We started with this, didn't we? I even did the voice a bit then, didn't I? <laughs> didn't even mean to. <laughs> Jane said, Oh, he's doing fine. That's how she speaks. Quite <laughs> butch. He started going to church. <clears throat> and the old lady said, Oh, that's good. Jane says, Yeah, they meet on Saturdays. They study the first five books of the Bible. He's usually there for about five hours. Oh, says the old lady, definitely did the voice then. She pulls a concerned face, like that, just like that, and says, whoa, what a thing to have happened. And obviously, says, he's nuts. And here we all are, having studied the word. What a thing to have happened. And we've been through this account that we see depicted by this picture. To Timothy. As for you, continue what of you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you've learned it. How from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, the Torah, the Word, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Yeshua HaMashiach. Continue. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And so the word comes, uh, it corrects us when we get off course. We're to be mindful to continue on in it, as we've just read, lest we will have believed in vain. Strive to enter through the narrow door. Many, I tell you, will seek to enter and not be able, and they'll probably be completely freaked out. Philippians 2.12, Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is not about making a show for man. This is about being humble before Jehovah, completely submitted to him. 
Put on the armor. Walk in accordance with the word. Stand and pray. You've got an enemy who wants to ruin you. Yeshua's words. Watch and pray. Note. Pray. Pray. Hold fast to Yehovah. You don't want to be deceived and end up finding yourself going after a false god. Hold fast to Yehovah, which is to hold fast to the word. We are called to be vigilant. It's valuable to take the time to sit and listen to the word of Yehovah, just as we have done today. It is good to concern ourselves with holding fast to it. For those who have been washed, what will you do? Will you continue in what you've believed or will you return like a sow to wallowing in the mire? And if you have, you need to repent. I'll not make some drama of saying sorry, but to truly repent. You've been baptized, which represents dying to self, repentance, turning, but it doesn't end there. We saw that the price that was required for you to be counted as a son or daughter of Yehovah was paid at Golgotha. To be counted as one of the sons that go free, we take up our cross and we follow him to the place called Golgotha. We lay down our lives that we might live as represented by our baptism, our full immersion. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God and so we are. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Whoever is born of sin, does not, born of God, does not commit sin. The children of Jehovah purify themselves. Yeshua said to him, he that is cleansed, he was washed, baptized as it were, need not save to wash his feet. See, represented by the daily cleansing of the bronze laver of the priests, washes his feet, he walks according to the word. Folk of their own standard by which they judge who and what is blessed. But according to Yeshua, the one coming back, the one who says, Behold, I come quickly, my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. According to him, it is those who continue on in his word, guarding it, and cherishing it, that are blessed. Indeed, he says this as well. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Should we pray? Lord, thank you for your word. Um. Just I hope, Lord, that there's none of us who take it lightly. I pray that whoever hears this teaching will will have the, be confronted with who they are, Lord, by the scriptures, and that it would bring cleansing. Thank you, Lord, that you've put it in our hearts to want to come to know you. That we would meet here on your holy day, the Sabbath. To be together as your people. And to hear your word. Lord, that we would never lose sight of the importance of watching and praying and holding fast to you. I hold him fast to your word. I pray that there be no complacency, Lord. That we would be vigilant, that we would watch against all the things that would come that would be profane. I thank you, Lord. What a blessing it is to be able to walk in your ways. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for calling us for the great blessing that it is to know you. Amen.